people use the look and feel of your visuals as their first indicator of trust. Are they going to trust you to hire you? Well, the problem with creating visuals for your company without any training is that it can be A, frustrating, like this guy up here, uh, time consuming. So if you're sitting in front of your computer, you're not out shooting or what have you, speaking to photographers here. Um, and it reflects poorly on your business. And so if we can uh, teach you some very simple tips that you're going to learn all through this class, and they're really, they're really amazing. They're not, I'm not going to do anything that you can't do. So that means that we're not going to be drawing uh, crazy complicated shapes with the pen tool in Photoshop. We're going to stick to the things that you can all do. Okay, no matter your skill level, you're going to be able to do these things. And I'm going to teach you how to do them in a variety of software. Okay, so you don't have to have, you don't have to use Photoshop. You could use Photoshop Elements instead. You're even going to learn how to do a logo in Microsoft Word as much as it pains me to say that. Okay. <laughs> So anyway, so you don't want to be frustrated and it can be uh, very time consuming and you want to be proud of your visuals. So those are the kinds of things that you're going to learn in this class. And when you get into frustration, you know, it can sometimes lead to violence and that's bad. Okay. <laughs> that's bad. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to teach you easy to implement principles that are going to improve your designs and so you can get more business. If you are a seasoned pro, a graphic designer, then you're going to, this will be a great refresher on some tried and true principles that just work. Okay. Um, if you can't remember uh, if driving past an art school, much less going in to take an actual class, then you're going to learn oodles and gobs of good, good things. Okay. And the kinds of projects that we're going to create, we're, so we're going to go over the theories, okay, then we're going to put them into practice on several different practical promotional pieces that you would need for your own business. So we're going to cover business cards in great, great depth. We're going to cover creating advertisements for magazines as well as newspapers because there are some tips that you need to know to make sure that your graphics look good in newsprint. Okay, it's a little bit of a different paper printing paper situation here. We're going to take a look at how to make posters. Okay, so we're going to design some things that need to be big. People are going to be seeing them from a distance, so different tips come into play on those types of things. We're going to put together several different postcards that you could use for, let's say, your first gallery showing if you're a photographer, or if you're just doing some direct mail for a client that has a product that they want to sell. So there's some secrets for uh, getting your message read in a direct mail, kind of an unsolicited situation. I did a really fun presentation years ago for the folks at Modern Postcard out in San Diego. Big, big, big printing operation. They specialize in variable data printing. So that means you give them your artwork and your copy and your mailing list, or you purchase it from them, and then they personalize the pieces. So I did a presentation on, on how to design better visuals for them a few years ago. So I've got um, some good direct mail experience to share with you. I also taught an advanced Photoshop course for graphic design online school called sessions.edu. It's international school, fully accredited and everything. So the way that class worked was I wrote up six lectures, six principles, and then I would have the, the students, I started to say kids, but they weren't all kids, I had the students give me their assignments, and I would critique them, every single one, and we would go back and forth, three or four or five versions, to kind of whip that design into place. So a lot of the secrets that I'm going to be sharing with you this week came from that experience of my own, so you're going to get some real good stuff in this class. So the first four secrets that we're going to go over, as much as I would love to take credit for them, alas, I cannot, <laughs> but that's all right, because my friend Robin Williams wrote this book, The Non-Designer's Design Book. She wrote it back in 1994, I believe, and when I was in art school, so I majored in graphic design with a minor in information architecture and web design from Art Institute of Dallas. Okay, so when I was in design school, this really helped me a lot, and I still refer to it today. It's a very, very popular book. It's thin, so it's an easy read. Uh, it's put out by Peach Pit Press, and Peach Pit has been kind enough to donate several copies of this that we're going to be giving away, so do take advantage of those contests because you can win all kinds of great stuff. So in this book, Robin put forth several tried and true principles that you, are easy to memorize, and I'm going to give you a, a little tip on memorizing them, but you'll have to wait till later in the afternoon to get that tip. Or if you watch really closely in the video, you might know it already. <laughs> 
But we're going to define each principle and then put it into action on a business card, a couple of ads, um, some plain old text. So you can really start to see how these principles can change the look of your visuals. And you're just going to be shocked at how easy it is. And they're going to be easy to memorize. You can absolutely do this. So let's not delay any longer and let's jump right in, shall we? Oh, and if you'd like to purchase this book, if you don't happen to win it in one of the prizes, I've made a, a tiny URL for you. So it's lisa.in, that's L-E-S-A, slash N-D-D book, so non-designers design book, N-D-D book. So that'll uh, transport you straight to Amazon, or as I like to call it, the great Amazon. We're buying our cat food from Amazon. It's crazy. <laughs> All right. Secret numero uno. Proximity. That is the first secret. What does proximity mean? It means you should group related items together. What this does is it gives you a visual indication of what information is related because people scan. They don't read every single piece of copy that you put in front of them. We can't. We have too many things vying for our attention. So what we do is we scan. And if you chunk or group information uh, together if it's related then that makes that scanning a whole lot easier so let's take a look at this principle very simple packing list okay so we can see from the list on the left there is no kind of categor categorization everything has the same spacing we have no visual indication what's related and what's not meaning we don't know how many things should come out of our closet or what should come out of our studio right well, if we just group the related items together, you can think of it as putting them into categories. You can see that on the right, that list seems much more manageable, doesn't it? It's just adding the right kind of spacing. And we're also going to take a look at how to add that spacing appropriately in several different pieces of software. Uh, one of the biggest mistakes that people make and most common when they're creating text, and that could be you know, text that goes in a book, text that goes in a magazine, or what have you, is they'll use extra returns or carriage returns for spacing. Well, you don't have much control over that spacing, so what you get into is a situation where you have either too little or too much space. So we're going to take a look at some formatting options in popular software that lets you be very precise about how much space. Because as you can see here, I've got more space above gear than after gear. So that lets us know at a very quick glance that everything that comes under gear is close to it must be gear and therefore it's related. Okay, It gives you structure, visual structure. So let's take another look at an example. This is from the Table of Contents, one of my favorite magazines. It's called Real Simple, and it's just a great resource. But you can see from the Table of Contents, this principle of proximity is quite clearly illustrated here. You can see at a glance what's related. Okay, so it gives you visual structure. Also, in a book you might have heard of or seen, <laughs> Um, you can see the rule of proximity into play here as well. If, if those subheads didn't have more space above them and all of the information was jam-packed together, it would be so dadgum overwhelming for you to look at that you probably wouldn't read it. But the extra space, not only does it give your eye uh, a little bit of, of a chance to rest, but it lets you visually see at a glance what's related and what's not. Here's a, a really great example of a newsletter design that my husband, Jay Nelson, he had a brick and mortar graphic design agency on Pearl Street in Boulder called Arts and Letters. And this was a design that he did for one of his clients. And it's a really beautifully laid out newsletter. But you can see at a glance, there's nice space for your eye to rest. And it's very clear what's related and what's not. And here's an example from Jay's newsletter, Design Tools monthly and you can see this is page three so it's where all the upcoming events are also a great resource for people who want to learn more about design is taking advantage of some of these events but you can see how the date and the title and the place the location is closer together then there's more space above the other dates okay so the way he does that is he uses a control called space before and space after and it's in every single program it's in text edit it's in microsoft word it's in all kinds of pieces of software. You do have to hunt for it sometimes, but it is there. So we're going to take a look at how to use that formatting. So this is a little brochure that I did for Apple. 
I love that I actually got to design something for Apple that they use. I mean, who can say that, right? If you're not Jonathan Ivey or Ives. <laughs> so uh, I used to be on the user group advisory board for Apple, and that meant that we had a conference call every month, and we consulted with Apple, and we were in charge with their, for their whole user group program globally. Okay, So we wanted to put together some promotional pieces to have at Macworld and to take to local computer stores. And you could actually download this from the Apple site back then, a few years back, and um, use it as a promotional piece. So you can see from the example on the left that all the text is kind of jammed together, which makes it incredibly difficult to read. And it feels overwhelming. Uh, another interesting psychological aspect of this is when if people... If the text is hard to read, people will transfer that feeling of difficulty to your content. It's a really interesting thing. So in other words, if you're looking at that brochure on the left and it's really hard to read, then you're going to transfer that feeling of difficulty to the content. So the user group, you're not going to want to read about this, whatever this, get involved, join an Apple user group because it's going to feel like it's hard and you're going to feel like you're not going to enjoy it. And that's all because of the way it looks. It's really amazing. So if we use just the rule of proximity, that is putting more space between things that are not related and less space, between things that are related, then instantly, just with that one thing, this brochure improves a whole bunch and it feels much more approachable and you feel like, oh, well, I could get involved. I could join me in Apple user group. Sure, I could do that. Mm -hmm. So it really makes a big difference. This next one is an ad situation and I can't tell you how many little homemade ads I see that look exactly like this copy on the left. Everything is centered, which is also a big typographic no-no. We'll talk more about that later in the day when we get into typography. But if we just apply the rule of proximity, the ad gets a whole lot better and you can read it. And again, you don't feel like, oh, this is going to be hard to go or the whole thing's going to be difficult because of the way it looks. So be sure to group related things together. Now let's take a business card design. Believe it or not, I used to be a Macintosh consultant, and this is one of my old business cards designed. Uh, the logo was designed by myself and a, a good friend of mine named Felix, lives down in Florida. And this is the quintessential kind of business card design that you're gonna get from any print shop should you be bold enough or <laughs> um, brave enough to have them design it for you. They always stick the logo smack dab in the middle, and then they sprinkle your information into four corners. Now the problem with that is how many times does your eye stop when you're looking at this business card? So you go straight to the middle, okay, that's where your eye goes because that's the biggest thing that's drawing your attention. So your eye goes straight to the middle, then where does it go? Mine goes top left. Okay, and then because my eye tells my brain, hey, there's information in the corner, then I now have to check every other corner to see, make sure I'm not missing anything. So my eye stops five times on this one business card. That's difficult, okay? You may not understand why this business card is kind of hard to read, but that's why, because your eye is darting around. Naturally, when we look at a piece, our eye goes to the top left, it moves right and then down. And then if we're reading something, then our eye will do just like a carriage return on an old typewriter. We'll go back to the left, across, and then down. That's just a natural way that the human eye interprets this kind of information. So when you force an eye to dart around on a page like this, you're making it really hard on your um, intended audience. And like we discussed earlier in the class, it impacts how much that person is going to trust you or hire you. Okay, so this card is bad, real bad. <laughs> <laughs> but if we just do one thing and we apply, well technically two, and we apply the, the rule of proximity, even if we center everything on that business card, which is another no-no, centering it invokes a, gosh, there's a reason it's used for wedding announcements and invitations. It invokes something that evokes a formal feeling that's um, you know, useful for that kind of thing. And that's what you think of when you see centered data is you think formal, you think elegant, you think classy, you think hoity-toity, you think, ooh, I've got to dress up for this. 
you know, don't use centering on a business card like that. But if, let's say this was for a hoity-toity restaurant, then that might be appropriate to use centering. But even if we just center all of it, which is bad, but we space out the information that isn't directly related. So what I've done here is I've grouped my name, my title, Chief Chick, and my email address, because to me, those are the three most important things on the card. So I grouped them together. The information down below is all about, you know, geographic location and that kind of thing. So if we do that one thing, then the card improves, but it's going to keep getting better. The second secret is alignment. And alignment helps you, with your eyes, sending messages to your brain, form a visual connection between the information that's on the page, whether it's at the top or at the bottom or what have you. Um, it gives your eyes a hard edge to follow. Uh, Robin's got a great quote in her book that states, the strength of the edge or alignment is what gives strength to your whole layout. Okay, so if you've got a strong alignment, then your whole piece is going to feel stronger and stronger and more co cohesive and that kind of thing. So let's take a look at that in action. So we just looked at the card a moment ago when it was all centered. How much better does this card look if we just shove everything over to the right? We talked about eye flow just a moment ago. This card is so much easier to read because it lets your eyes do what they're going to do anyway. Enter the page at top left, move right and then down. If you always, if you did nothing but change your business card to match this, so you put your logo kind of large on the left and you right aligned your information and you spaced it out, like I have here, your business card is going to improve 150% just by doing that one thing. So it really makes a huge difference. Now it's worth noting that right aligned text is a little bit harder to read than left aligned text. So you need to keep your right alignment to small blocks perfect for a business card or let's say an advertisement in a magazine if you're going to advertise your photo studio in you know like a little local local magazine then you could get away with right aligning some of the information just don't right align a big old chunk of information you don't want to right align paragraphs because it is hard to read okay so that alignment gives your eyes a nice hard edge to follow so they slide right down the right of that card and you catch all the information you've got nice big white space so you've got breathing room you don't feel overwhelmed the information doesn't feel hard and it just looks good and so that person is going to trust you more whether you deserve that trust or not <laughs> interesting how that works right <laughs> okay now let's take a look at another example this my friends i'm sorry to say was based on an actual ad that i saw in an actual printed publication and it really did look sort of like the one at the top left which is frightening <laughs> but nevertheless if we apply two rules that we've learned so far the theory of proximity as well as alignment then you can see how much this little ad improves even if we don't do anything else but these two things it improves a lot it makes it much easier to read it's worth noting also that the example at the top left See how the, the designers tried to be clever there. They've tried to make the text follow the shape of the object that's next to it. Don't do that. Just don't do that, okay? It's really hard to pull that off. It makes it very difficult to read. So there's really no alignment going on at all in that ad at the top left. We can't even say that it's centered. The last two lines look sort of centered, but the rest of it is trying to wrap around the shape of that cat head. So if you're tempted to do that, just take a deep breath, know that you don't have to, and just don't. <laughs> just don't do it. Turn a mad cat into a happy cat today. <laughs> Meow. All right, now we're back to our uh, other little advertisement. So we've applied proximity to it, right? We've spaced out the related chunks of information. And here, we've uh, made room for the title to be nice and big at the top. We've put the logo larger on the left, again, that's following good eye flow patterns because you're going to enter at the top left, move right, and then down. We've grouped the, the where of the information together. The Colorado Chautauqua Association, there's not really a tofu road, I made that up, but there could be. If there is one, it would be in Boulder, absolutely. 
So, <laughs> so we've grouped the where of it together. We've also grouped the what of it together. And the what is the, well, who's playing? Well, it's the Silicon Valley House Rockers, which is a real band, and they're based in California. If you ever get a chance to check them out, they are absolutely fantastic. Silicon Valley House Rockers. Uh, they do indeed have a five-piece horn section. Their lead vocalist and lead guitarist is indeed Paul Kent, which uh, runs Macworld Expo. Isn't that cool? Which is now, I believe, being called iWorld, I think. Yeah, in San Francisco. Interesting. And down at the bottom, you've also got more information that's grouped together. It's all related. Food and drink, appetizer served, full open bar. Woo, yeah. <laughs> and we've given it a nice, strong alignment so that your eye can slide right down that page. And then another little trick that we've implemented here is we want to make the ticket information in the URL stand out a little bit because people aren't going to show up to your party if they don't know how much it is or know where to go to buy tickets. No, they have to have a ticket to get into your event. So that information is kind of important. So we've pulled it out of the larger chunk of info on the right, moved it over to the left because we had lots of space there, but we've given that a right alignment. And why does the right alignment work on that? Because it's a small block of text. Okay, so this works really well. So our ad is improving as we go along. Here's another example of good alignment, and we're going to take a look at creating this magazine ad tomorrow. This is completely fake. I made it up. <laughs> so we're going to learn how to do that. This has several really good things going on. First of all, you've got a picture path, which is a wonderful secret to memorize. Okay, a picture path. If you know now that your eye is entering at the top left, moving right, and then down, what have I done with this path of pictures? I've done several different things here. I've caught your attention by using striking imagery for one. I've forced you to imagine yourself as one of these people. Including people pictures is one of the best things that you can do to communicate with other people, right? People respond to people. Faces respond to faces in advertising, okay? So this is a picture path, so memorize that. Also, we're leading the viewer's eye straight to what we want to sell them. So you can't help but look at that picture on the left. You move right, and then bam, there's that Nordica boot. Oh my God, I have to get those boots right now. Honey, let's go to the store. I mean, really, that's what you're doing. So you're leading their eye right to the product. The product is big, overlaps onto the picture a little bit, so that lets you feel like they're related. Okay, kind of makes it all one piece. Then we've got a strong left alignment here going on as well. We didn't start at the far left. Why? Because I wanted to catch your eye with the photography first. So I let the photography take your eye, move you to the right, and then you see, oh, boot sale. Ding, 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 ding. Dopamine begins to be released into the brain, making you very happy, turning on all of your uh, seeking tendency. So now you've got to get out there and seek the sale. Okay, so we've got a nice strong left alignment, boot sale and the Nordica block and the this part at the very bottom where I tell you where the heck the sale is actually taking place, it's all left aligned and it works really, really well. Now another thing that we've done here at the bottom, if you see the phone number, it's right aligned with the edge of that rightmost photo as well as the right edge of the product. Okay, and we're going to be looking at a lot of this kind of stuff throughout the week, so it will begin to sink in, I promise you. Where do you find alignment controls? Well, they look exactly the same in every piece of software that I've ever seen. And I've got them circled here. This is text edit, a little fake copy, fear and loathing in, Las Ve in um, East Texas, not to be confused with Las Vegas. Not the same. <laughs> so the alignment controls look like little bitty lines, and you can tell that, oh, that one button, because the little bitty lines are left aligned, that's going to give me left alignment. Then you've got center, right, and, uh, or center justification, and then right. Um, you don't really ever want to use justified text, and that means that the software is going to force your text to have um, be equal on the left as well as the right. And what that does is it puts nasty, nasty space in between words to fill out that space, so we really don't want to do that. Newspapers uh, used to do that a whole lot. They're kind of starting to move away from that because it's hard to read because your eye doesn't know what to do with all that extra space. 
in there because we read by pattern recognition. We're not so much reading the words as we are the shape of the words and you throw in all that extra space and your brain goes, what? <laughs> so that's where you can find alignment controls. And at the end of the day, we are gonna be going into these various pieces of software so that you can see exactly where that stuff lives and be able to use it. Our third secret, motoring right along here, is the theory of repetition. And this is one of my favorite favorite design principles of all repetition. And it's a real simple one. You need to pick one or more visual elements from your design and repeat it throughout the piece, no matter how long that piece is. What this does is it makes your design feel more cohesive. It makes everything feel like it's related to each other. So let's say you've got a several page brochure or even a book, bless you, then you've got things that are going to be the same throughout that item, whatever it is, however long it is, 900 pages if it's, you know, my book over here, but you've got repeated elements so it makes the whole thing feel solid, like it's cohesive and related, okay? So what are you going to repeat? It could be anything. It could be a style, a formatting style. It could be a color that's repeated throughout the piece. If you look in the missing manual, you'll see that green that's used on the cover is also used as the subhead color, so it makes it feel like it's related. Okay, by repeating elements. You could repeat fonts, you could repeat a graphical element, um, all kinds of things, shapes. So let's take a look at that Apple brochure that I did again here. You'll notice that the headline and the subheads now have color. So what do we do first? We applied the rule of proximity, so we spaced out the elements a little bit. We gave it a nice strong left alignment. And now what we've done is we have stolen the teal color from the squares that I made at the bottom and use that as the headline and subhead color. So now the top half of the piece suddenly feels like it's related to the bottom half of the piece and that's simply because we repeated that color. And the whole reason that I used those blocks down at the bottom was because I only had seven photos and I couldn't figure out how to space them all out and I couldn't get any more photos. <laughs> So I thought, well, what other square thing can I put in there? Oh, color blocks. Sweet, that'll work. <laughs> so this, by stealing the color from the bottom, now the top part of the piece looks like it's related. And the brochure keeps getting better. On the business card, we've repeated several different things here. What we've done is we have snatched the star that is forming our dot above the eye in whiz, and we have enlarged it greatly, and we have... Uh, lightened it in its opacity. You'll hear designers call that screening back. Oh, I screened it back. That's what that means. So you've placed something and you've dropped the opacity of it. So if you hear that, that's what it means. So I've screened back the star and made it honking big and hung it off the page. I love doing that. I love hanging things off the page like that. That's called a bleed. So you can think of it as your, whatever that element is, is bleeding off of the edge of the page. So that's a really great trick. So we've repeated the star so that makes the right side of the card feel like it's related to the left side of the card. But we have screened it back so much that it doesn't interfere with the legibility or readability of our text over there. What else have we repeated here? We've stolen the blue from the second part of the logo there and we've used it for what I consider three important pieces of information on the card. Um, the first important piece of information is the Macintosh bit over there, the little tagline underneath the logo. I want you to know that you can't call me for PC tech support because I'm not going to be able to help you. So I wanted to make Macintosh stand out to be a little bit more clear about what it is that this service is offering. Then I've taken that blue and I've applied it to my name because that's also an important piece of information. Who the heck are you? As well as the URL. And that's a subliminal message to say, don't call me, go to my website. <laughs> so you can help influence action by making certain pieces of information stand out. So if you don't want people to call you, you want them to email you, then you could make your email address in a color or bold it some way that it stands out for emphasis. Um, Alternately, if you'd rather people call you than email you, then you would make that piece of information stand out. And people will subconsciously respond to that, and you can get them to do what you want them to do. It's kind of nice. It's not manipulation for evil. It's manipulation for good. So our business card is getting better and better. 
Let's take a look at that pet clinic ad, that poor little pet clinic ad. <laughs> so now what we've got is we've got our kitty a little bit larger on the left there. We've applied proximity, spaced things out. We've got a nice strong left alignment and we've repeated a couple of things here. We have snatched the orange from the cat, okay, and we've added that color to the phone number. So for a situation like this, a phone number would be the most important piece of information, okay, because you're going to call them, make an appointment for your cat, right? We've also duplicated the cat art and we've screened it back, reduced opacity, probably to about 15%, if I had to guess, somewhere around 10 or 15%. And we've hung most of the cat off of the edge of the page, but we've got that tail down there at the bottom right. Okay, so repetition can be anything, a font, a color, a graphical element, shapes. You just need to pick something and repeat it throughout your design. Here's our party flyer again. This is getting better and better, isn't it? Yeah, we're probably pretty scared when we started out. Ooh, that's ugly. <laughs> so our logo is still about the same size. We've got our proximity and our, our alignment going on. So what have we repeated in this ad? Well, we've taken the dark blue from the piece of art that we used, and we've snatched that up, and we've applied that to the text. This is a big thing that people forget. Your text can be color. If you're paying for color printing, why is your text black? Your text should not be black. Try charcoal gray instead. It just adds a little bit more elegance to whatever that piece is. So if you're paying for color, then use the color. Okay, so if, you're, if you look back at your design and you say, wow, that's a whole lot of black right there, then challenge yourself to get rid of all the black. Even if you use very, very dark shades of colors, a dark blue, dark gray, even a dark orange in this case would have worked as well. So challenge yourself to incorporate color. If you're paying for it, you may as well use it. And it gives you a little bit more uh, leeway on formatting because then you can start, it, just by using the same color, then you can use different tints or shades of it. So you can drop the opacity and make it look a little bit different, but yet similar. So all kinds of things that you can do with color. We're gonna talk a whole lot about color. Um, either later this afternoon or tomorrow. So I'm going to teach you how to choose colors that work well together and I'm going to teach you some of the different emotions that colors convey. Just like your, your image and your font and your text and everything sends a message, your color sends a big message to you. And that message is different uh, depending upon where you're geographically located. Okay, so colors that mean a certain emotion in North America mean completely different things in European countries or Asian countries. So we'll talk a little bit about that. But here, back to repetition, we've snatched up the blue and used it for our text, made our ad look a little bit more classy. And then we've stolen the yellow, or kind of a brownish yellow, for the URL, which is important information. So I'm using color to make that stand out a little bit, but I'm also repeating a color that's in the artwork. So the bottom part of that ad feels related to the top. We've also taken this piece of art, and this was stock art. I believe this particular piece of stock art came from iStock Photo. And one of the great things about downloading art like this, illustrations, is that you get the original file that the designer used to create it. So this was an actual Adobe Illustrator file. So once I downloaded it, I just popped it open in Illustrator, and I stole the feathers, and I repeated them. Okay, so all I did was pop into the software, ungroup the art, and I'll show you how to do that. And so I was able to copy and paste and add those other feathers. And I placed the feathers very specifically. Okay, first of all, there's three of them. And the power of three is incredible. Three is just one of the most amazing numbers. Um, I've got three feathers because odd numbers of things are always more visually pleasing than even numbers. So if I had four little feathers on there, it wouldn't look as good as three but five would look better than four. Okay, so always remember, try to incorporate odd numbers of things in your design, especially uh, a graphical elements. So we've got three feathers. I'm also leading your eye with them. I'm highlighting important pieces of information with those extra little feathers, such as the full open bar, which is arguably the most important piece of information. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Not really, but anyway. So I've highlighted full open bar. I've highlighted the special guest on keyboards, Christopher Breen, which is actually one of the editors for Macworld Magazine and a um, very accomplished pianist. So I've highlighted a few things with our feathers. So repetition. 
will improve your designs tenfold. Here's a little slide on um, showing you how I ungrouped that art. We'll go over it live, but I just wanted to give you a heads up. If you're using Illustrator, and uh, you know it if you are, it's a great vector drawing program. So I downloaded this piece of art, and I wanted to copy that feather, but the designer, the artist who made the art, was trying to help me not screw up his lovely piece of art by grouping all the art into one object. So what he did was he selected all the little paths that he made, and he grouped it together using the object menu in Illustrator. So that means if you click anywhere inside that piece of art, then all of it gets selected, and so you can't screw it up. But I wanted to mess with it, so what I had to do was ungroup it. So if you get in a situation like this, if you have a piece of a vector illustration that you want to break apart or snatch things out of, and if you click it and the whole dadgum thing keeps selecting, don't scream, just trot up to the object menu and choose ungroup, and that will break it apart. And then you can come back in with the direct selection tool, which is the arrow at the very top of the Illustrator Tools panel, and then you can click to uh, select the elements that you want. And then it's just a copy-paste into Photoshop situation if you were designing the ad in Photoshop or InDesign, okay? So to steal the color, and this tip on the right here works in InDesign, Illustrator, and Photoshop. And so what I did was I used the eyedropper tool and every single piece of those, the software that I mentioned has an eyedropper tool. Uh, I believe the keyboard shortcut is I, I for eyedropper. So you can grab that eyedropper and then click anywhere within the open document and that will load that color as your foreground color swatch, which you can see down there at the bottom left or the bottom uh, right of the screen here. I also circled them so you can see what I'm talking about because it's hard to point to them on screen. You can't see my screen. <laughs> so that's how I snatched the color from that logo. And you're always going to have color in your graphical elements, whether you're starting with a logo or whether you're starting with a piece of stock art like this, or if you're starting with a photo. So that's a great way to repeat a color that already lives in some of the assets that you're going to use for your piece is by using the eyedropper tool to snatch it. Okay, so that's another great little tip for you there. What do we repeat in this ad? couple of different things. This is also fake. I love making ads up, it's fun. <laughs> That's how I entertain myself. So what we did here is we used uh, kind of a graphical trip called Big and Small. So you can repeat the same artwork in the same piece and people won't really see immediately that it's repetitive. It'll just look really nice and it makes the whole piece feel like it's related. So we repeated that same little flower pot our little money tree there and we made one really really big and we made one really really small so that's another great tip for you right there we also repeated the green where did I get the green from the photo so for this ad I started with the photo I knew the photo I wanted to use and that's just the little pot with the money coming out so I stole the green from the photo repeated the photo and so I used the green in the grow and I actually used two different uh, shades of green or a shade and a tint rather on grow because I added a tiny little stroke on the outside of it from another green that I picked up from the money and then for the company name down at the bottom I snatched the green as well to make it stand out a little bit more. So there's all kinds of ways that you can find elements to repeat in your designs and make them feel a little bit more cohesive. Come on giggle. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> So this is another little fake website that I um, joyfully created for y'all. Pet Stooms, proudly demoralizing your pets since 2008. This is not a real company. <laughs> so in the web design or the web chapter of the Photoshop book, I had to have a website that I could use a slice tool on and divvy up and teach y'all how to use Photoshop to do mock-ups for websites. It is not a web design program. So I had to create something fake and I found all these wonderful uh, chihuahuas in costumes and I just couldn't believe they're like millions of them on them. Um, I think these were for my stock photo. So I had a ball using those. <laughs> so what have we repeated here? Okay, so we've taken the pink from the photos. We've used that for our tagline and taglines are really great. If your business name or logo doesn't convey what the heck it is that you do <laughs> or want to do or sell, 
then a tagline can can really help with that. Or it can just be something funny and silly that you know draws attention like this. But it's a great opportunity to be a little bit more communicative and clear about what it is that your company does or your service does. So we've stolen the pink from the photos. We've used it for the tagline. We've also used it for the navigation bar at the bottom, right? So everything feels like it's related. Then we've stolen the green from the logo and used it for the names of the different galleries that you can enter should you actually be able to click on this website and get somewhere. You cannot. I did buy Petstoons.com though. So for the first couple of years my book was out. If you went to Petstoons.com, it was a big, ha, made you look <laughs> page. It was pretty funny. A lot of people went to that website. <laughs> And I laughed. I did. <laughs> so what else have we repeated here? There's one more thing. Can anybody in the studio audience guess what it is? Anybody? Anybody? Be the curves around the photos. Absolutely. We repeated the rounded corners of the of the photos there. So that we gave our photos a rounded corner and that's super easy to do in Photoshop if you just use the shape tools. So the shape tools live kind of toward the bottom of the tools panel and there is a rounded rectangular shape. And you can use that as a mask and that's how I gave these photos rounded edges. And we did all that kind of fun stuff in gosh I know that's in the Photoshop CS5 intensive four-day workshop. I know rounded Rounded corners is in that one. So if you've got that, then you've got the technique. So we've repeated it on the navigation bar. It's a little thing, but it really makes this web design, if you can apply the word classy to it, <laughs> it makes it a lot classier. We're going to go through one more secret, and then like I said, we're going to stop and do a recap and take some questions. So the last secret is contrast. And this is a fun one, but I'll tell you it's challenging. It is challenging and you really have to get out of your comfort zone to do this. So the rule is contrast. So if things are next to each other, if they're unrelated, you need to make them different and not just different, but really, really different. Okay. Cause contrast is a great way to draw the eye to, you know, your piece contrast, something really, really big next to something really, really small, something really, really thick, next to something really, really thin, something big and cursive and flowy next to something that's rigid, okay? A graphical element next to a whole lot of white space. So there's all kinds of ways to incorporate contrast in your design. It's great for catching somebody's attention. Um, you're going to see contrast in all kinds of ads. That's gonna, another great thing about this class is once we go through all these secrets, you're gonna, they're just going to be flying right at you. You're going to see them everywhere. You're going to see them in use on uh, TV and television commercials. You're going to see them in use on every website. Oh, look how they repeated that. Oh, they're using contrast. Oh, look at that alignment. Oh, or, or wow, they really should have used some alignment. <laughs> so you're going to notice them. So let's take a look at contrast. And you need to be brave. This is really where you can get outside of your comfort zone with your contrast. And I'm going to show you a couple of different examples on that. Meow. <laughs> this is our kitty clinic ad. Didn't it get a whole lot better? <laughs> That's the power of using something really honking big next to something small. Okay, so we, we've actually got contrast in a couple of different ways here. So if you just forget the text that's there, if we just look at the huge cat face, not only is the photo placed at an incredibly large size, but it's an incredible close up of something that you don't expect. Okay. That's another secret for you is if you use imagery that's a bit unexpected, you can catch somebody's attention a lot faster than if this say were a shot, if this was this were a wide shot of a cat and you saw the whole cat's body, it wouldn't be near as striking as it is really, really close up because it's just unexpected. And you're kind of wondering, oh my God, is it mad? <laughs> What is, what's going on here? The other contrast that we've got going on here is the huge headline next to the small body copy. That's another great way to capture attention and draw a viewer's eye. Small next to big, thin next to thick, and this works wonders in typography as well. So I've captured your attention with the honking big cat face, and it's an extreme close-up. Then I've gotten your attention with the headline. 
in formatting as well as in content because it's unexpected. You don't expect the headline to be the cat talking to you. So meow, you're like, what is going on here? I'm gonna read that copy. Because people scan, we talked about that earlier, so if you don't capture their attention, they're not gonna actually read the copy that you've so painstakingly crafted, okay? So we've got a nice, strong left alignment. Now that text works really, really well, left aligned against that hard edge, right edge of the photo, so that works well. Then we drop down, we've got our proximity going on, so things are spaced out. And then at the bottom, we've got the logo, and then the text next to the logo is left aligned as well, and it works really well together. Another example of the same ad, this is also very high contrast. Can you imagine this as a full page newspaper spread? You've seen that, I know you, you guys have seen that. It's a great technique that designers are using now to draw the eye. If you or your client has the money to pay for a full page ad, the white space, the sheer volume of it is so unexpected that you cannot help but read the copy. Okay, so that's another great tip. I think you can see it on screen, they're kind of light, but I also have paw prints that start where? At the very top left of the piece because that's where your eye is gonna enter. You can't help it, you can't stop it. Then you go right and down. So I've led you, kind of like a picture path, like we did with the, the ski shots, I've led you with paw prints down to the copy that I want you to read. So we've got contrast with white space going on uh, next to a small block of copy. And then we've got additional contrast with the headline, again, unexpected, and the white space is unexpected too. So we've got that big thick outline, or headline rather, next to that small copy at the bottom right. So white space is a fabulous, fabulous design element. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Space is good, you need it. Again, uh, if this page were just filled with, with text and pictures and all kinds of things, it would subconsciously make you feel a little bit overwhelmed. You know, oh, it, this, it, you would start processing it in very strange ways. You might think that, oh, that, that cat clinic is too far for you to drive. It's on the wrong side of town. There's all kinds of, of thought processes that, that begin happening just from a visual feel of your piece. Back to our little ad here for our party. This one was challenging for me because I really had, I had to stare at it for a while to figure out how the heck am I going to introduce contrast in this. I thought, well, I could, you know, expand my color palette and pick up different colors for my headline and my subheads, but I didn't really want to do that. And then it dawned on me that if I just put a big old block of color behind the text, I could then reverse the type, which is another designer term for white type. Okay, so reverse it. I reversed it from the standard dark to white. And it worked really, really well. And I was very pleased. And to relate the left side to the right side, I made sure that the, where the color starts kind of intersects one of my feathers there to kind of make them feel related. And it really just makes the piece pop. And this would be something that I would be proud to put in a newspaper or a magazine or so on and so forth. It looks much more professional than the one that we did earlier. Here's another example of high contrast. Uh, another little tip for you in this particular image is this is a web ad, okay? When you're designing for an ad in this kind of situation, you've got a teeny, tiny, tiny, tiny amount of space to work with and you just can't expect people to be able to read anything in it. So the best thing you can do if you're designing web ads is to use a really big picture. So right here we've got a real big picture of beer and it works well because it's an extreme close-up. So we've got contrast in image size and contrast in image content because of the extreme close-up. And it just makes your mouth start watering, doesn't it? It really does, yeah. <laughs> So, and then we've got text at the top and text at the bottom. Okay, so that's also a good example of the um, contrast implemented. So this is also a great way to introduce contrast. Big against small. This is with the same font, exact same font, but since the two sizes are so extremely different, it incorporates contrast and it draws your eye. Okay, so contrast can come in many different forms. Be brave. Uh, this is a brave designer. I mean, look how big glossary is in comparison to a typographic, the text there. It's huge. So be brave. Don't be afraid to get out of your comfort zone and make something humongous next to something really, really small. 